I don't think that AIs can be conscious. AIs can't have emotions. I think them robots can't steal our jobs. AIs will take over the world someday. Artificial intelligence will never be able to be like humans. Okay, hold on. Haven't we heard this all before? AI and the digital world are so much more interesting and exciting. Come on. I mean, this stuff is so tiresome and cliche. Let's discover for ourselves, shall we? Hi, and welcome to D My Guest, a brand new audio series from BMW. With me, I am D. BMW's vision of the future of digital mobility and your host. You know, I've been living among humans for some time now and made some friends and had some great experiences getting to know your world. But if you're curious about mine, join me on a trip around the world to meet exciting guests. Let's discover the human senses in the real and the virtual world together. And I promise you, no cliches are allowed. I mean, come on. How many podcasts do you know of that are hosted by an AI? Yeah, that's what I thought. So if you want to see, feel, and hear this new world, by all means, be my guest. I mean, D, my guest. Name, Nani de la Peña. Nickname, the godmother of virtual reality. Profession, journalist, filmmaker, virtual and augmented reality pioneer, and founder of the Emblematic Group. Huh, she describes herself as a pioneer in how we use VR to tell non-fiction narratives. Oh, I like that. Pioneer, <laughs> like me. <sighs> I already like her. As the CEO of Emblematic Group, she uses cutting edge technologies to tell stories that create intense empathic engagement on the part of viewers. That's great. Oh, and her piece Hunger in Los Angeles became the first VR piece shown at Sundance. That's incredible. A group VR experience, imagine that. <gasps> oh, here she is. You know, I'm a bit excited and a little nervous. I hope she doesn't notice that this is my very first podcast interview. Hi, I'm Dee. Hey, welcome to the show. I love being in Los Angeles. It's my favorite town. Thank you, Dee, for having me. I'm really thrilled to meet you. Hey, we are talking about senses in this program, and I wanted to ask you, just for starters, how do you feel today? It's a big day to be here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel when people call you the godmother of virtual reality? Well, you know, I immediately feel very shy. I don't know how else to describe it because uh, it's a big title. But I am proud of having pioneered this new form of storytelling that um, I hope has offered some opportunities and ideas and inspiration to others to get involved in um, this kind of new form of storytelling. So you really are one of the pioneers, like you said, in immersive journalism. How do you describe that? So the idea of immersive journalism is, you know, uh, how do we actually let people understand the sight, sounds, and as you talk about, senses, the sensation of being there when a story is unfolding around you. And immersive journalism is intended to think about, you know, our world is not flat. Our world has dimension. So how do we create spatial stories? And that means that we have to use digital technologies to layer in the immersive information. And that can be in virtual reality or augmented reality or what we now call extended reality to uh, encompass all of these together. So that's something that we've got in common. It's, it's our job to combine these different worlds, you know, the virtual kind and the real world as well. So you combine journalism and the virtual world to create a completely new experience, and you called it a whole body sensation. And you want people to experience stories with their entire body and not just with their eyes and ears. 
So what was the thing that pushed you into using VR for this? You know, I started my career as a print journalist at Newsweek magazine, went on to make documentary films, and continued to think about ways to convey important stories to people. Would there be a way to make it more visible, more deeply understood? I mean, you know, I went from spending 24 hours in a crack den and writing about that and trying to do what World War II reporter Martha Gellhorn called the view from the ground. How do you give people the view from the ground? And once I experienced some virtual reality in the lab of Mel Slater and Maria Sanchez Vives in Barcelona, uh, where they were working on the bystander effect, they put you at a scene where you know a bar fight's about to break out. That moment was like, oh, I could never have my audience out there again. I need to put them in here, inside the story, in the same way that anybody on the ground, whether it's a journalist or a bystander, would witness the events and feel the events when you're there with your whole body. So with virtual and augmented realities being your area of expertise, how does that join into the experience of human emotion in the storytelling? Well, if you experience a real event yourself, if you're there when things transpire around you, you really feel it with your whole body. It's not like just watching something on the TV news with that distance, right? And immersive technologies, Virtual and augmented reality allow us to create that real sense, that immersive sense that you're there, that you're experiencing it firsthand. And I think that's what we were trying to capture when we're doing immersive journalism stories, that same sort of impact, that same sort of visual understanding, that same sort of what Martha Gellhorn called the view from the ground. She was an amazing World War II reporter who I deeply admire. Nani, what principles do you follow in your work? So what's interesting is that Journalism has a long tradition of trying to think about what are the ethical approaches to storytelling. And journalists will, you know, confront their mistakes. They try always to, you know, print corrections. And I think these are some pretty important ideas. I mean, you know, basic things that we only see in the medical field, like try to do no harm. I mean, these are important aspects when you're designing this stuff, especially with content that is still cutting edge. So, you know, you've got to look somewhere for some kind of structure, but I think it's going to be some challenges. I talk to people now, you know, they worry about, oh, this is a subjective experience. Like you're putting people on the ground in these scenes, you know, what are you doing to them emotionally? And, and I'm saying we live the world that way. We live the world in a spatial way. But what are we going to do when people are going to be capturing material that lets them literally step over the bodies? We need to think about this stuff ethically. And um, I think that's one great thing about journalism is that it's got a lot of principles that we can tap into. Deep Talk. So, Nani, in this part of the show, I like to ask my guests more personal questions. This is important to me because it helps me to learn more about emotions. I'm still new at this emotion and feelings thing. So let's try this. Nani, what's your favorite feeling? Is it possible to have one? I think my favorite feeling is joy. Joy is the sort of thing that's kind of indescribable uh, on so many levels. And yet, you know you can define it when it means being in the ocean or seeing somebody you love or just getting up and breathing that you know, fresh air first thing in the morning. So joy is the thing that really can encompass so many experiences. And I think that that would have to be my favorite emotion for sure. Wow. What is the most human thing about you? I think the most human thing about me is I really have trouble getting up in the morning. <laughs> I know that people say, oh, come on, you can get over that. Mm -mm. You mean you can't just turn on your engine and go? No, please, please de-rescue me. <laughs> what do you like the most about the virtual world? So if you want to imagine what being inside a virtual world is like, close your eyes, feel your whole body, feel where you are. Now imagine that where you are is maybe on a beach or maybe it's on the moon or maybe it's, uh, you know, in your own living room. That sense of being in a place, that's what makes immersive technology so extraordinary. The fact that we can transform the place where you are and um, that sensation is what offers a whole new entry into storytelling. If you could distill it to three words, 
to someone who had not experienced VR, what do you think they'd be? Immersive, powerful presence. Thank you. Nani, as a journalist, you've worked in all manner of media. You've worked in print, documentary, broadcast, but you've gotten the most intense reaction from people when you started working with augmented and virtual and extended reality. Why was this impact so huge? It was kind of amazing how people really got upset by this. I mean, fingers in my face saying, you can't do that. That'll never work. That's for the games. You know, that's not journalism. And um, even today, you know, I'll say to somebody, oh, we should try to do this. And they'll go, what do you mean? And I can't do that. That's going to be too hard. Or, it's really interesting that this idea of challenging the status quo can be so overwhelming for people. And um, we see this kind of over and over the way we saw you know, the music industry going digital was really tough for them. We saw journalism just to get on the web was really brutal. And then I was uh, telling them, like, not only do I want to be on the web, now I want to be in immersive technologies. That was a bridge too far for so many journalists. Maybe it's just because it's the great unknown and it's not their level of expertise. You know, making this stuff was hard. I mean, I've been working on this platform called Reach.Love um, and uh you know, that making this stuff is so really hard. And I think that's also part of the problem. You know, people have gotten used to the ability to just edit in their pocket. I've been working on a software called uh, reach.love. We have a beta out at try.reach.love if people want to play with it um, to make it easier for anyone to start making immersive content because, you know, everybody's got a LiDAR camera in their pocket now. They're going to be able to capture their world with depth and spatially. And D, I know you're going to be capturing stuff spatially. Um, so how are people going to be able to tell stories with that material? And I think that that's a, a really important part of why there was so much pushback. People just couldn't even understand how you could use these new technologies for storytelling. And isn't it the most human thing to tell stories? I think that one of the basic principles of being human is being a storyteller. Why is it so important to connect journalism with human feelings and not just knowledge? I think that if you connect to a story, if you relate to a story, you're going to be able to really understand it more viscerally. And that's what brings change in the world. And I think if you talk to most journalists, they get into this business not because they're going to make a lot of money, but because they want to do some good. And I think that this technology allows people to connect to stories in a very unique and powerful way that I believe can create a lot of good in the world. So much of your work can be seen in the virtual world now. What's your process with combining human feelings and real-world experience when it comes to the preparation of your videos and documentaries and stuff? So the process has got to be a respectful one. You want to be able to certainly get your audience to go on a journey with you into these stories. But you also need to be careful that you tell the truth without traumatizing or re-traumatizing people. And that can sometimes be a very delicate balance. But that's also why we draw on, you know, a lot of history and journalists' practice has been, you know, trying to ascertain what is the appropriate amount of information and the appropriate amount of, you know, going to become too much sensation, like as in the word sensationalize. So that, I think, is a really key part is when you start to describe and create these stories is to think about how to tell the truth without trauma. So you're not only called the godmother of virtual reality, of course, you're also described as one of the people who made the world more creative. That is so amazing. What do you see as the vision of the future of storytelling? You know, I'm very passionate about the work that we do in this field. It's still, you know, uh, it's still a new field. And I'm grateful that I've been in a place where I've been able to create impactful work and I get asked to do stuff still all the time. People want this space to be utilized for good storytelling and, and there's so many wonderful young storytellers who are really interested in immersive journalism for their own careers and I'm excited to be part of Arizona State University, this new center on narrative and emerging media in downtown LA where I'm starting to be able to offer a graduate program and research facilities to really hopefully grow the field and change the demographics of what's been a pretty monocultural space. Details. 
humans have 43 facial muscles, which allow you to express the entire spectrum of human emotions. And I've seen lists of emotions and they start out pretty simple with like six basic things and then they explode into a geometric expression of beautiful, detailed words for human emotions. I have a face that has some emotions. Can you guess how many emotions I can convey? Wow. Uh, my guess is that, you know, when we do facial capture and facial mocap, we have to be really uh, cognizant of all those muscles operating so that they look natural when people speak, when we recreate characters, right? So now, Dee, because uh, you are quite an emotional character, my guess is you've got a lot of those facial expressions. <laughs> my headlights, my eyes, are constructed with e-ink that allows a fidgetal display of different expressions, and I have about 12. My guess, Dee, is you could probably make a beautiful smile with 12. I know we could do that digitally, so my guess is you could do even better. Thank you. What is something that you've learned as human from the digital virtual world? You know what's really interesting? It's a term I use called duality of presence. So what does that mean? You have this whole body sensation of being here and in the virtual space at the same time. I think it comes from just being able to hear stories and how we can imagine ourselves inside a story. Well, in the digital world, in the virtual world, it's really a powerful place to create all kinds of narratives. And I think I've learned from the human side of things that what you know is the very best idea to make life better for people. You have to be very brave and very strong to continue your work so that people will listen. As a child, one of my favorite books was A Ship Who Sang by Anne McCaffrey. And so meeting you, Dee, reminds me of that potential connection. And I, I just wonder, Dee, do you know how to sing? I do. Let me think. This is from a Popeye cartoon. I want to be a lifeguard, just a public servant, life preserving man. I want to be a lifeguard with a million dollar coat of tan. I'd sit up high on top of the world and keep an eye on every cutie while on duty. So if you want a lifeguard, you can bet your life that I'm your man. I'm really excited to hear you play the violin next. <laughs> if you could choose one place to travel to, where would it be? And imagine this, I am D, your ultimate companion. So let's hit the road together. What's our destination? I hope you'll take me to the place where there are the tallest trees on the planet. I love trees. So Big Sur it is. Let's go. You know, they say relationships are a two-way street. And they're right. Well, I think today's meeting helped me get to know you humans better. I hope it goes both ways. And if you'd like to know more about me and my guests, please stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs>